<laughs> Liz, can you say hi? Oh, I think we need. Are you plugging Liz in right now? We're working on some technical difficulties. When I was in Hawaii, it was like masks everywhere. Kind of like very like take it very um, seriously. I, that's why the adapter stopped working. That's why that hung one but away. But I live in like the, the Florida of New Jersey. Jersey. Oh, that's <laughs> it's, like it's a culture shock, right? <laughs> But when I came back, it was actually the culture shock. I was like, why is everyone got their mask on? That's like, hey, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> intense. <laughs> I wonder, that's got to be hard, too, to be like, what am I doing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that feeling comes from time to time. Uh, <laughs> I went to a, a, a street Did festival I turn it recently down? Um, to do a gig for a friend. Okay. And it was the first time I was out in, like, a street festival since I was in And there was no masks. Yeah. So I was wearing a mask. And so we were big kids, right? So, like, was it FX in there? No, they couldn't wear yeah. But then I saw all the other Asian people were wearing masks. I was like, okay. <laughs> 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 I'm going to represent my people. I'm going to put it on. <laughs> it's like, this feels good. I feel like I'm in good company now. Yeah. You're going to try your alternate question here? But it's, it's, it's like that awkward dance. Yeah. Like, do I do Alternate uh, chord. That's it's the one that you had. Liz, just so yeah. you know, in case you don't know what's going on, uh, we're just working out some type of technical difficulties because you can't see. <laughs> Literally behind your screen, <laughs> where people are scurrying around. Oh, yeah, that makes me turn up. We're living in the future and the past. Yeah. I mean, she could probably just like yell really loudly and we'd be able to hear like just from home, but that would be. Straining. This is a TV. Not a console. It was a good time in Hawaii. Oh yeah, it was great. Ooh. I mean, we we planned it. So we thought that uh, everything would yeah, be over. <laughs> Liz, can you say hi again? Just keep busy. <sighs> <laughs> it seems like maybe it's just quiet and or delayed. Can you ask her to describe what she said for record? <laughs> Liz, I was wondering um, before we get started if you could describe what you had for breakfast today or what you would maybe theoretically have for a breakfast if you feel like that was invasive. <laughs> Can she hear what goes into the microphone? Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Liz. Sorry. <laughs> Hello. And you can hear us pretty well, right? Hmm. Can you give us a thumbs up if you can hear us? Okay. Yeah. Um, hey, Lydia. Oh, interesting. Right, you can, right? There's something. Yeah. Like very quiet. What's it called? Very interesting. This is why we should have invested in the little segues with the iPads on them, oh. which I think about a lot as a technology and one that like never caught on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Oh, 
Oh, what? I think he did. I think it went over a cliff. Yeah. Wait, Wait, what? what? <laughs> I think it did, yeah. That is some yeah. urban legend. No, it's real. Oh I thought God. like it was supposed to be like self-balancing, and that was the whole thing. It's like balanced by your body weight, so. Oh, yeah, that's not, that's not. But it had its whole second life in those like hover boards everybody was like they were also around. super dangerous right yeah there's a kid in my neighborhood who rides around the block in that and his mom drives behind him really slowly <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the weirdest it's so weird because oh. he's going so slow and she's going even slower hey, in her car. do you mind um just checking what your on your end your it's mic is set as <laughs> or like when really, you speak really are weird. you getting like mic volume in the little icon on the bottom left of Zoom? Yeah. You are? Yeah. Okay. And Henry, are you hearing her? You're hearing her quietly. Yeah, very quietly. I hear her somewhere. I, I just don't, I can't figure out where it's, is it? And can you keep talking? Oh. 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 It is the speakers, right? The card is it is very low, even though this is cranked. Something's. No, I don't think it's that. I think it's something. I mean. Um, maybe. Yeah, I don't think it's that. Although the, the computer volume is really loud. Yeah, and everything else is working fine. This is fascinating. And if I set it to the TV. Oh, oh it sounds that. louder. That's a TV. Uh, oh. A little bit, yeah. Yeah, we can hear you through our like built-in TV now. <laughs> it is It's still pretty quiet. It's getting increasingly louder. Hello. Hello. Hey. Yeah, we're Oh, maybe if you do the audio, is there an audio out for the TV and you can do the audio out and go We're about to be I wonder if it's going to be really <laughs> Suddenly, Liz is just like flat. There's only audio in. Turn on speaker out. Liz, your background looks amazing. Oh, thanks. Yeah. I just moved here. Oh, wait. You just moved here and you set that up? That's amazing. Yeah, I know. I literally set this up. Like, I could do not have clear light. So, well done. <laughs> All you need. <laughs> Can you mic the TV? I know that that's wild, but. Um, if the speaker is <laughs> actually somewhere. We're going to go like well, true punk rock and just mic the, the amp. Mic the amp. <laughs> um, we could do that, yeah. Do you want to grab a. There are always solutions to technological problems <laughs> if you are committed enough. Yeah, that's a solution. A s <laughs> opting out is a solution. Removing removing the situation is a solution. Um, to anyone who is watching, I don't know if this is actually streaming yet, yeah. but if you, oh, great. <laughs> to anyone who is watching on the internet, um, thank you for your patience. Um, and anyone who's watching as in the future, also, you can fast forward to this part. You don't have to have watch the whole lead up, but you can, you can. Oh, hi, Dubois. <laughs> Good to then. <laughs> the technological problems really couldn't happen with nicer people, so thank you all for yeah. <laughs> for being so supportive in this. I'm incredibly impressed. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly because I'm incredibly useless. <laughs> yes, I'm glad that I have no, nothing to do with it. Oh, God, no. <laughs> Jesus Christ, there's so much technology. Mostly just unplug it and it's not
your kids are, are your kids old enough to be like the IT in the house yet, or are you still? Oh, she has actually. She helped me with Zoom. Really? My daughter, she, because she was on did at school and I don't do yeah, any of the Zoom meetings and have her set things oh, up. Oh, no, wait, not yet. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, because she knows how to change my background. Oh. Give me a nice cartoon faces. That's fun. <laughs> That's fun. Did you show your filters yet? That type of thing. That's fun. Yeah. Very useful for me. And turning them off. Very important too, right? <laughs> I wouldn't know how to do it. <laughs> she could sabotage you so Yes, I know she has a dog face. <laughs> there was a lawyer who was a cat. Oh, I saw that. Yeah, the, that? yeah, the judge. Uh, but apparently he's like a horrible guy. Yeah, but he's like, I'm not a cat. <laughs> it's like a milkshake duck <laughs> situation, which is something, a reference I only know. So I, like horrible people. <laughs> but then there's also the guy who got himself trapped as a potato. <laughs> Just oh, like she was great. She worked for a nonprofit. <laughs> um, I'm a potato. Can you have her talk now? Hi, Liz. Can you, um, once again, we never heard what you had for breakfast, and we are interested. Um, I had a really gross kale smoothie for breakfast. I drank all of it, though, to try to be healthy. I regret it. I should have drank it. Um, okay. And a piece of toast. Um, and some zucchini bread that I got from the Dutch market. Okay. Um, and we can put it too close to the little key. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was great. Um... Hung out with my cat, um, watching around my neighbors. Oh. Great morning. Great morning. That sounds. Thanks talking. That was excellent talking. Zach, do you need more talking? No, I'm good. Oh, great. Hi. Welcome, everyone. We're going to get started. <laughs> um, I am Ali Katz, and I'm the program coordinator here. And once a year, I host an exciting program called the Bernheimer Symposium. Uh, and the Bernheimer Symposium, uh, and I just want to talk about the event a little bit, is supported by Kate Levin. It's in the honor of a comparative literary teacher and scholar, Charles Bernheimer, uh, who taught here for a really long time, was involved in the founding of the Writer's House. Um, and it's an opportunity to like think really expansively about the kind of programming that we do and like what we're doing. Um, and it's been a really exciting opportunity to bring, especially like cartoonists for me right now, um, uh, to the writer's house. So, so part of the vision specifically tonight was to, to talk a little bit about like a weird framing that I think we can say is probably the case for the past probably 20 or 30 years of cartooning where it's like, oh, comics, they're not just for kids anymore. Um, that's so important that comics aren't just for kids when really they're also for kids. Um, so uh, we have three amazing cartoonist artists who are here to talk about their work that is for grownups and also for children. Um, and not in like the way that, that like the Muppets are for you know, kids <laughs> and and for grown-ups, but like, you know, they work, they do work for both. Um, so uh, we have Liz Montag, Mike Des Dawson, and Andrea Surumi, and I'm gonna introduce each of them, um, and as I introduce them, and by that I mean read like their proper introduction, uh, they'll talk a little bit about what work they do. So I'll read the introduction, and then they'll talk about themselves very briefly, and then we'll have a conversation. I've got some questions. Perhaps they have questions for each other. Um, and if you, audience, including the audience online, have any questions, uh, you can feel free to join in. So once we get to that Q&A part, um, you can just raise your hand at any point. So we won't sort of separate those things out. All right, so we'll start with Liz, who is joining us via Zoom. Uh, Liz is a cartoonist, writer, and illustrator whose work focuses on the intersection of self and social awareness. She began contributing to The New Yorker in 2019 as a cartoonist and is illustrated for the US Open, Google, and the 2020 Biden presidential campaign. Liz is currently working on a young adult graphic novel and picture book for Penguin Random House, as well as a young adult series for Scholastic. She fundamentally believes in representation, accessible information, and drawing your feelings. Hi, Liz. Hey. Liz, will you describe your work a little bit? I mean, we, we're not doing big visuals today, but what in general is like your work for grown-ups? What form does it take? And what is your approach to working for kids? Um, my work for grown-ups mainly has been like single panel work for the New Yorker mainly. 
I mean, I guess I usually come from a kid's perspective, which, like, I didn't notice until other people started pointing it out, but I guess I've been a kid for a lot longer than I've been an adult. So maybe that's just my regular perspective, which is very childlike. Um, and I just try to tackle, you know, the big feelings, feelings and issues as accessibly as possible. Um, the kid stuff is new and exciting, but very, very new. Um, and this book is coming out next fall, right? Next fall is the graphic novel comes out next fall, and there's a picture book that comes out in the winter, and then the series starts coming out like the year after. Oh wow! Oh wow! That's a that's a lot of work on your plate. And uh, what are the the titles so we can all pre-order, get ready to pre-order? The first one is uh, it's called Me Be an Artist. I don't even know. Like, <laughs> I just get really loud or something? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's okay. It's, <laughs> it's exciting. Um, and then the second one is a picture book about Jackie Worms that doesn't have a title yet. And the third one for Scholastic is called Purple School Magic, but I don't know what the uh, I'm sorry, can you say the, the name one more time of the series? The Brooklyn School of Magic. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah. sorry. It was just, it uh, fades in no and out a little bit because of our... Well, Brooklyn School of Magic for the series. Oh, that's cool. Oh, awesome. Uh, yeah, and I'll have some questions because I feel like your work really is the most radically different probably in your approach between like a gag comic and like a, a like sci-fi fantasy <laughs> middle grade fiction approach. Um, sure. Awesome. All right. We're going to go to, we're a little feedback-y right now. Um, Zach's working on it. So I'm going to speak quietly. Mike Dawson. <laughs> so, so that's so weird. Uh, Mike Dawson is the author of several graphic novels and comics collections. His work has appeared at The Nib and at Slate and has been nominated for multiple Eisner and Ignatz Awards, as well as a Slate Cartoonist Studio Prize. The Fifth Quarter is his first book for middle grade readers. He lives at the Jersey Shore with his wife and children. Hi, Mike. Hello. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, so tell us a little bit about your work. Yeah, so right now, um, uh, recently, the fifth quarter of the first book came out in May, and the second one comes out next July, which I hear is actually quite rapid for, uh, for publishing. Um, so, so that's mostly what I'm working on is sort of like my daytime stuff. And then at the same time, I'm, I'm at the moment been uh, doing uh, diary strips um, on my Instagram, um, but like really making like an effort to... to to take it seriously and put up a lot of work. Um, so that's actually like, I sort of see that as my second project. And that's not aimed at children. It's kind of uh, all over the place. It's a, it's, it's a mix of like family observations and then like, you know, philosophical essay type stuff. Um, but you know, it's actually very rewarding to do. Awesome. Um, yeah, your diary comics have been, uh, oh, I have a small child at home. I have another small child presumably coming and uh and there's a lot of i think a lot of people doing sort of parenting comics of young kids like very young kids um so it's really cool to see someone dealing with teens <laughs> and their specific very compelling uh needs and narratives i i my, a friend of mine got married recently and uh um his wife it's our second marriage so she has four children already who are all um between eight and eleven and my friend was like, well, all the hard part's done. <laughs> <laughs> and we're all like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> there like, some hard parts to come. <laughs> are you telling me it's not a cakewalk at like 12? No. I thought 12 is when I got like super easy. Um, it's got to be better than two. Uh, <laughs> uh, Andrew Surumi is an author, illustrator, and cartoonist who lives with their spouse and their dog in Philly. Uh, they're creator of the children's book Accident which is one of my two-year-old's favorites, um, Crab Cake and I'm On It, an elephant and piggy-like reading book, and the illustrator of David Goodner's Kondo and Kazumi series. Her comics, which have won Society of Illustrators Awards, have been published by Hick and Hawk, The Believer, and Toon, among others. Also, huge news, this book just came out, Mr. Watson's Chickens. Everyone should get it. Uh, Sequential Philly also just did a really awesome interview, like three-part interview, uh, with you, which was really great. I loved watching the coloring process. Oh, um, flatting. Lots of like, flatting. 
Gosh, like, flooding <laughs> saves your life. Really, really awesome. Um, this book is great. It's a lot of chickens. I'm very excited to read it once again to that two-year-old. Um, so uh, tell us about your work. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you all for coming out here and tuning in. Um, so I, I work in children's books. I make, I write and illustrate uh, picture books for kids and early readers now that um, I did the Elephant and Piggy series. And I, my background is also in indie comics that are not specifically for kids. They're, you know, uh, for people. <laughs> I mean, God, <laughs> kids are people. Uh, <laughs> I've already um, drove this car off the cliff. Um, but uh, sorry, Segway. sorry. My background is definitely like indie comics and uh, children's books. My twin loves, but my professional uh, focus is mostly children's books at the moment. Um, Sorry, that was a car crash of an yeah. answer. A Segway crash, which is a callback to oh. a previous. <laughs> um, awesome. So I like first. My first question is an economic one, <laughs> not like in that it's brief, but <laughs> in that it's about sort of finances. So cartooning, known for its big money, obviously, <laughs> uh, <laughs> adult-oriented cartoons sell hugely, but um, really. There's a lot of economic pressure. I'd say there's like a pretty big market probably for kids in YA compared to adult comics. Is that right? Am I right in saying that? Anyone can answer. <laughs> That's to all of you. That's an open. Uh, yeah, definitely. I, I don't want to jump on anyone if someone else wants to answer it. Um, oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the... I think it, there could be. I think there definitely is tons of interest in uh, adult comics. And one of the cool things that came out of the 2020, 2021 publishing numbers was that um, graphic novel sales show a, showed a growth, an increase, um, also among adults. An enormous amount of that was manga um, that drove you know, a lot of graphic novel sales. Uh, woo. But yeah, I mean, like, Traditional, like indie comics, traditional cartooning, it's like next to impossible to make a, yeah. a living doing it. So right now, and this is for all three of you separately, are you like, this is, this is the job or are you like secretly also like copywriting for like Abercrombie and Fitch? Like, <laughs> well, so what you were saying before about like, um, adult, like, you mentioned before about like how perhaps we all have done work that's like aimed at adults and we're yeah. doing work for children. Um, one thing I think was thinking about recently is that so when I first got into like indie comics, I had this sort of purist idea that like I wasn't worried about an audience and I just sort of would make comics for me or something like that, some sort of chest beating kind of thing. Um, and what I've sort of realized in recent years is that's still thinking about an audience because it just was the audience was just a person like myself. Like, you know, the idea that I'm not, like, having any, any audience in mind is, um, you know, it's just not true. Um, moving to middle grade, for me, like, it's just, uh, the difference for me, it's not, it is definitely economical, but just the excitement that I think that you actually get people who are interested, like, very excited to, like, pick up a book that you've drawn and, like, thrilled that you made it and, like, impressed that you made it. And, like, I know that's just, like, a very nice thing, um, I find. Um, in terms of the answer of your question, in terms of am I, I'm doing this full time, but I do like to say that I have a spouse who like has a more steady job. Um, there's more consistency in what she's doing, um, which I don't think I could do <laughs> otherwise. Yeah. Um, Zach, can you turn up the volume again a little bit? Sorry. Um, so you gave yourself till 26. Have you hit 26? And now you're like... So you did it. You, you're you successful. I mean, you've got the like amazing number of projects lined up. Um, 
It, I feel like, do you feel as though maybe when you're talking about writing for young people, that pressure's off a little bit? Because, like, you know, kids either really like books or they don't. You know, you're not going to get, like, a lot of, like, wishy-washy feedback, I feel. Is that true? I mean, Penelope either likes a book or she doesn't. She's two. She's yeah. not writing any Goodreads <laughs> reviews. She's not leaving you any sort of feedback on... Uh, that's that's my kid's name. Um, not leaving any feedback on Goodreads, but like, kids tell each other about books that they like, and they hand off books that they like, and and that kind of thing. Um, does that make you feel m more confident when you go in, or like more nervous? Is that set of questions in making a book, or in like what you've done, like when it's out in the world, like this oh. is when you're thinking about your audience, when you're thinking about like. Who am I speaking to? How can I get out there? Do you feel more confidence or less working for kids? Do you mind if I jump? Um, you're, you're completely 100% correct about kids' honesty. It's amazing. They are so brutally honest. It's, and like they just don't care, and it's amazing. Like uh, They will let you know right away whether or not they like something or they don't, or they, they want to contribute something. And it's so pure and wonderful. Um, it's weird making, I am gonna answer your question. I realize I'm taking the long route around. Um, it's weird making work for children because like our, our audience doesn't actually buy our stuff. It's mediated through the parent. And so for picture books, it's weird, right? Because mostly picture books are read by the parent to the child, right? Um, but middle grade, early reader, YA, that's when the kid can read it themselves. And as a result, I feel like there's a lot more, you know, like heavy hitting censorship and stuff that clamps down in picture books. Like people, you know, start marching and stuff about two gay penguins right. <laughs> when it's uh, picture books. But uh, it's a little bit more open sometimes for middle grade or YA. Um, as far as confidence, I, I, I return to what you, what you said, Mike, which is like, I, I enjoy just, I, I mean, I, I wish I had more confidence, but like, I, uh, I don't think it makes much of a difference whether I'm creating for adults or creating for kids um, in how I feel about it. I, I, I just want to make the work, um, and I'm excited about making that particular work. With kids, it's, I guess, actually, I have more doubts because I haven't been a kid for like 25 years or so. <laughs> so there's more of a gap there in experience and uh, things that I just don't know. And also, there's also like a little bit more responsibility, like what you're representing, what you're putting on the page has a ton of power, um, especially how it sits on the bookshelf against all the other books that were there before or not there before also has a lot of power. Um, so that's just, it's a little different, I think, if you're talking to children versus adults because you really you know, want to take care with, with that. But um, I, I go back to like my misstep earlier, like you know, kids are people, so when I'm talking to kids, <laughs> well, it, they, we think about them as a kind of protected, specialized grouping of citizenry, right? But like when I'm making Crab Cake, I'm making a book about uh, despair in the face of catastrophe and ecological disaster, right? Because I feel that fear, and I want to talk to that fear in children, and I have no answer for that, and they have no answer for that. And it's like an honest connection thing, and that is really just what it is. Like, I, I just want to connect with them that way. So the fifth quarter, this is my first book that's aimed at middle grade readers. Um, I, I leaned a lot on just, like, observing the children that I see around me. But I was very sort of, like, I will say I was sort of, like, worried that it was going to, like, ring false. That, you know, that I wasn't going to, like, I was going to write something that they could, they'd be like, an old man wrote this. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was lucky enough that the book that came out at a time when I was able to do, like, one in-person classroom visit, um, 
and like with a group of kids who had read the book, and they really did seem to like it, but it was surprising to me the things they liked weren't what I thought they would be interested in. I thought they'd be interested in the subplot about the mother running for town council. <laughs> <laughs> but they weren't. <laughs> but they were interested in how the fourth grade girls were all mean to each other. Um, they, were, they connected with that quite a bit. Um, I can't believe that they're not that interested in political intrigue, but you know they'll get there, probably. Um, so that's actually, it raises a really interesting point, and you know, uh, Liz, Mike, you both do a lot of middle grade stuff. Andrea, you're doing more like kids, littler kids. But like, do you, what do you do to get into that mindset um, of like what a kid is gonna wanna read? Like wh what process, what is your process for that? Liz, do you wanna? Um, my process is like, so I'm like at my desk right now and I have to I was thinking, like, okay, what would she want to read? I could show you guys. Like, oh, my <laughs> gosh. <laughs> From 2005, I was nine. Um, and I just think, like, okay, what would she want to do? And that's, a, that's the history cycle, too. <laughs> what about you? Um, and when you're, you're doing that, like, do you, are you concerned? So are you like, oh, is is the me of 2005 gonna be the same as the the little me is the new <laughs> the new wave of kids in like 2021 2022 whenever the like when they start reading the book um i mean i feel like i can relate to like i, I think in my head i can relate to kids of today's age and that like when i was like in high school there was a conversation about like you know, gender, math, and it's about, like, what is all, like, that conversation was just starting, like, I had it in terms of, like, I was on the cusp of, like, it's definitely, like, less Oh, no. You've frozen. I think it's froze. Oh, oh you've unfro- you've, you're unfrozen. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I don't know how much that you heard, but I, I feel like I got a, a little taste of things. Um, I hope I'm relatable to kids today, of today, but I know that in the future I'll be unrelatable. Like, you know, progress will keep on going, and what progresses now will be in 100 years, and that's a good thing. So I think that all you can just do is try your best. Awesome. Mm -hmm. um, Mike, how do you get into the mind? Because not, I mean, you also you're a little far, you're, you're also like gender swapping your book. So like your, your characters are, are teen girls or. Yeah. So this, this book is about, um, a fourth grade girl. The sequel is about her in sixth grade. Um, and I, it's, a, it's, I had a sort of strange experience writing the sequel, um, in that I just had a contract to do two books, but I didn't really like have the second one thought out so much. Um, and that it all kind of happened. Uh, like I just started to write it when uh, COVID happened. And then I had my son who was seven at the time sitting in the room with me, um, like trying to do his schoolwork. Um, so it's very hard for me to think about mindset <laughs> when <laughs> I was writing the thing because I definitely something came out and something came through, but like it was a very weird situation that I'm sort of wondering I'm wondering if the sequel is going to be like very dark <laughs> because it was just a lot of like screaming at my son to like, you know, <laughs> do something on his, ver it was a, it was an awful like period of time. Right. It was hard. Yeah. Um, but, uh, I feel like in normal circumstances that I just tried to approach it as writing as I normally would. So I've written other books of fiction in the past that are definitely like uh, geared towards like an adult reader. Um, because they got lots of bad words in them and stuff like that. <laughs> um, but so I have fiction books, and I didn't feel like this was about doing things differently. I just felt like it was about centering the story of this person who was in fourth grade and then sixth grade, and just so telling this story. So it's boring. It's about town council. But if I'm telling it from her point of view, it's about her mom being too busy for her. It's about her mom being like not around when she's very excited about what she's excited about. And I, I really just felt that it was not, 
I, I just don't think it was a great, it would be, wouldn't be a great thing to be like, well, what would kids want me to say? I felt like it was better to try to just tell the story of this character. And I cheat a little in that just have kids around who are like the kids that I represent in my book, so that just sort of makes it a little easier to be a bit observational. Do you, like, ever check dialogue against them? Are you like, excuse me, <laughs> excuse me, young people. <laughs> I felt this <laughs> is this language. <laughs> Does this she sound said, right to you? Hello, bestie. <laughs> right, right. What is up, friend? <laughs> so your daughter just shivers. <laughs> oh, right. she, just, she doesn't want anything to do with it anymore. She's thirteen. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I, I another advantage I have is that um, my house is right next to the playground at school. Uh, so from my office, I could see <laughs> the kids in the playground, including my own child who sometimes is having a hard time and and it's nothing that any parent should have is is a <laughs> window to see the kids a having a window. hard time at the playground so I had to move to the to the back of the house <laughs> to move my studio oh wow yeah a, a literal window into your children's um social life no. actually sounds kind of like a nightmare no the parents shouldn't know these things <laughs> yeah I don't that sounds that sounds awful. And so, with like little kids, you're you're thinking more maybe about what delights them. Is that a fair? <laughs> it's funny you ask that because if I think about the picture books that I've done, Accident and Crab Cake, it's like the anxiety series. <laughs> <laughs> the, what 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 yeah. makes them miserable? <laughs> sure. Well, yeah, because like it's all about uh, you know just the human experience of being a person, which is not enormously removed as like a 36 year old or, or a six year old, right? Like fears, anxieties, worries, delights, like uh, the jokes are, uh, someone was gonna, someone asked me like, am I making jokes that I think children will find funny? And like, you just have to surrender that to the universe because you can't, you can't <laughs> program comedy for children. And, but uh, the stuff that I put in there is stuff that I find funny, like, people pretending they have total control of a situation, but they clearly don't. That's like all of British comedy, right? Like, <laughs> uh, and that's the, the chicken's book too, right? Like a ridiculous situation that people are pretending isn't ridiculous is just funny, it's silly. And then sometimes there's peeing, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Which is very See, funny. Right? Yeah, yeah, comedy gold. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, like, like this, I think like kind of just hoping that you're grounding their characters as real people and real characters like I, like you don't want to make a bad book you don't want to make a book where the characters are like wooden figureheads or it's just boring or it's bad or it's harmful right but like if you ground it in the like Guillermo, <laughs> Guillermo del Toro said like if you ground things in the emotional experience of the character you can take people from like step A to step you know Z and all of a sudden they're empathizing with like a clockwork vampire or something mm -hmm. ridiculous because they they follow the human steps of emotional, you know, empathy and stuff. So I think if you've got that down, then the details about like phones or, you know, what's going on in the world can kind of be arranged afterwards. Definitely. I think when I was a kid, I read the original version of Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret. There's some pretty like old technology happening in that <laughs> book. Uh, if you are a young person who read that and learned about some old technology. Um, oh God, the period technology the, yeah. from With the like, there's like a like, strap situation no. and like, it's like suspenders <laughs> for your underpants. Um, I had to ask my mom a lot of questions about that. Um, <laughs> but it was still, you know, the book still rang true for sure. Um, and I think one of the really compelling things about your work too is the um, the intricacies of the like visual gag, which is very fun uh, for kids. And when you're doing that, so you know, middle grade fiction, um, your audience is the kids. Picture books, the audience is the kids and the the grown ups a little bit. Um, are you doing it for you? Are you doing it for the reader, the the adult reading the book, or are you doing it? for the kids, do you think, when you're... Uh, it, I definitely, I mean, it's all for the eventual audience, right? Um, but I, I don't know about you, Liz, or, or Mike, but like if I get too in my head about picturing my audience, like breathing down my neck when I'm writing, it just locks me up, right? Like, 
at a certain point, you just gotta like close your door and be like, this is just for me. It's not real. It's all make believe. Like there are no rules. Cause you, you will just like cramp up and die. Like it, it, it will not work. Um, so like the visual gags, after a while, like with the comic stuff, like you, or with the picture book stuff, like it becomes a problem to solve, which is really fun, right? Like, you know, like I've got to, the joke is that these, these chickens are accumulating. So how do I make that funny? Or how do I um, like build up to that suspense on the, on, the, on the page? Or how do I like sell this punchline? Or, you know, and then like, then you get into like the visual textual workings of it. And it's just fun after a while. In the beginning, it kind of sucks. Do you guys feel experience that too? Like the the writing stage is not like super sexy uh -huh. and yeah, yeah, yeah. It's awful. <laughs> I like what you're saying about problem to solve. Cause I was starting to think about that in recent years too. Like mm -hmm. as like basically trying to solve a puzzle is actually that if it works and you solve it, it's very satisfying. <laughs> yeah. It's a good day. Yeah, it's a good day. <laughs> Um, that leads to like a really g just straightforward question about process um, for both your your work for children and your work for more adult audiences. Uh, and I'm pretty interested, Liz, especially in your perspective here because the work is so incredibly different. Um, like a gag cartoon, everything about a gag cartoon works so differently than a narrative. Um, like, what is your approach to planning? Are you are you write first, thumbnail? ink, blah, 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 like that step, or is it more haphazard? I definitely wait for something like that. I want to know what's going to be. Um, like, in fact, like the step before, I don't even think it's like, I want to try to enter into an entry point of like, too self-conscious or worried or anxious about what anyone would think and nothing would ever happen. Um, I think in my head, no one's going to see it, and then, like, it'll end up something like, I'm, I have this wrap my head around the fact that people are actually gonna like see the stuff that I've been writing for like a year and a half. And then I'm gonna have like a panic attack when they come out, but you know, hey, because that's your process. Um, but I think that, as far, especially for the gag cartoons, like Parker and stuff, I really think about what I'm invested very heavily, like what am I trying to see and how can I do that in the most effective way um, and in the most concise way, too. I mean, For feelings, you have more space. For opinions, you have just more space for everything. So it'll allow for just more room for personality in a way that I feel like you can have a person. They have a visual personality, um, but like, there's no like text mm -hmm. Do you do uh, cartoons for the New Yorker like weekly? I used to like in pre 2020, and then I did like all the cartoons and stuff about race, and they got really tired. So that would be. Okay. Um, with gags particularly, uh, do you find that like the idea comes first? So like the process, like does the idea hit you first, or um, does like the funny image and and then you have to kind of like doctor the words? Like which what process do you think? How's that work for um, you? I think for sure the idea. Hits first. I feel like. Especially because mine are so like, social justice oriented, it's usually like I have an opinion on something, or like I'll see something on Twitter, or, like, uh, like I have a very real opinion, and then like it's very responsive. That's probably why I got so When so once again, like thinking about process, and also thinking about editing, like. Um, work definitely in the New Yorker and then you were uh, you were in a weekly paper for a while um, but thinking about these books too you're going through like a pretty rigorous editing process for all three of you at sort of every level but editing comics seems trickier than editing uh, prose because it's a lot harder to make changes to like weird drawing you know it's there's there's a lot more layers to correct like, what is your approach to being editing, and what is it? What's that process feel like for you? So I um, evolved on this a lot, because um, comics. So when I was growing up, 
in the 80s and 90s, um, graphic novels weren't so around. They, they, there were some, but they didn't exist in the way that they do now. Um, so I sort of caught that first wave of uh, adult literary graphic novels in the mid 2000s. Um, and I did a graphic novel, it was all about, uh, it was an autobiography of how much I like Queen. Yeah. Um, and it was like 300 something pages long and I had drawn most of it and I did it all with a brush on like giant pieces of illustration board and like heavily, heavily crosshatched. And <laughs> it went to a reasonably large publisher and when it came time to edit, it was very much like, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> but I, and I like, and I don't think that made for the best book. You know, I made for an interesting book and I reread it recently because for a while I sort of hated it, but I reread it and I actually thought there is something interesting there that's like very honest, um, but you know, it's very sort of long and flabby and you know, there's things that could have been better about it and it could have, it could stand to have been edited. Um, the reason I can feel personally that I'm actually very comfortable with editing now is just a change in my uh, technology that I'm using, um, the, te the tools I'm using. Because now I work digitally and I just build my pages um, in Photoshop. Um, so now I do a rough version on a layer and I just do another rough version over that. And it's just, it's absolutely a completely different way of making comics from what I was doing 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and while they're not, very heavily cross hashed anymore, or, or you know, drawing wise, um, they're not the same type of thing. Um, I think they are better comics. Like I think that, you know, that they're it's better <laughs> <laughs> to be able to rewrite. Like it's a good thing. Um, someone once called like those early, um, you know, wave of graphic novels, sort of early aughts, uh, a lot of good first drafts. Um, <laughs> and you know, it hurts a little, but you know, there's <laughs> truth in that. <laughs> um, Liz, you're working on like with three different houses right now, right? Or like two, three, three. Five. <laughs> wow. How are you doing that? <laughs> I'm like a super scheduled person. Like I was at Aspen College. Like I'm used to like a lot of structure. Okay. So I'm just like heavily structured. Like, I'm walking every day. Everything is planned. I'm a Virgo. <laughs> Um, I didn't quite realize that it's completely different. So they, do they know just like the sheer, the volume of work that you must be handling? Are you like, how are you keeping, I mean, you say you're really organized, but that's just like a lot of characters to keep straight almost. Yeah. It's, I mean, I have a really agent who keeps all keeping me and is like, hey, that's pretty good. And I'm like, yeah. And like the, Picture book and the graphic novel book is the same editor. Right? Okay. The editor of Task is really cool. So, a lot of communication, a lot of like, hey, like, I'm a genius. I'm a genius. Capitalism is real, but like, let's not die for it. <laughs> um, and so, that, I, I, I like to set expectations, and I feel like I'm a really straight talker, and I think that that helps. Mm -hmm. um. Thinking a little bit about technology and also thinking, Andrea, about your chickens and how many chickens there are uh, and about process generally. Mm. There's so many chickens in this book, everyone. Mm. There's like, you should get a copy. There's, uh, it's a lot of it's chickens. It's too many chickens. It's, yeah. too, it's too many chickens to be in one house. <laughs> um, do you find, and thinking too, Liz, about like the amount of work you're doing um, and Mike about just like moving towards Photoshop, do you find yourselves borrowing drawings that you did before and copying, oh. pasting, and working over that, especially like between pieces of work, like mm -hmm. between books, between pages for consistency's sake, like the temptation just to pull and, and sort of work with that. How, how are you all working with that? Um, do you mind if I take? Okay. Uh, it's, a, it's a great also larger question of how do you work efficiently when you're under crazy pressure sometimes because um, some books are you know like like you know shark run hippo is like two characters on a page two characters on a page and and watson's chickens is 456 chickens like in a thing um and you need to make money in a year so how do and when your projects start overlapping how do you kind of like smush them out and not go crazy um i definitely reuse palettes 
Definitely reuse palettes. Uh, using Clip Studio to do color flatting, doing color flatting at all as like a comics technique to make the work go faster absolutely saved my butt many, many times with finishing books on time and you know uh, getting them done. Reusing characters is trickier. Um, it, it, a lot of my books have been so different that it hasn't really come up. Um, I have, uh, I think I always start my process on paper and then I'm still very comfortable working on paper first and then I'll move into uh, Photoshop or digital stuff for, for the coloring or the final stuff. Um, but I, especially when doing graphic novels, I was listening to um, a bunch of first second cartoonists talking about uh, Procreate and tablets and how that's like massively sped up um, the process of how you do it, um, which I think might just be a necessity for graphic novels, especially with like the amount of money you're making for a graphic novel and the amount of time you have. Like it can't take five years, even if it needs five years. So like being able to work digitally seems faster. I'm not there yet. I d just one thing on that is that, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm big on digital stuff now and I didn't used to be. Mm -hmm. um, I think it absolutely makes things faster for the economics and for the deadlines and all like that. But I actually have felt that it's improved me, like mm -hmm. my ability to write. Because, um, for example, I make comics, diary comics on my Instagram. I do, it, like, you know, a couple times a week, I post some fairly large comic. Um, I just wasn't able to do that, make that kind of work yeah. before I had an iPad. Like, I just wasn't doing anything. And, like, now I'm doing that, and it's actually strengthened my whole writing practice. Like, I just feel like upping my cartooning game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How about you, Liz? Are, how how are you dealing with technology and its its pluses and its minuses? Um, I started out drawing before I started drawing out like on paper. I was like physically, I guess. Um, but then I started drawing like on paper, and then I started drawing on like iPads, where I was drawing it in pencil. And so like I do everything in Procreate. Okay. I use Clip Studio Paint and Photoshop. Like that's kind of like my native visual language. Um, and then as far as like keeping like um, like borrowing these kind of things, I feel like this helps a lot with the project I'm working on now. Is for all characters I'm still familiar with, like the graphic novel is basically an extension of like the little flip art script that I did watching the picture. And the whole picture book is about Jackie Marks, who I just did a doodle doodle about in September. So it's like that style of art is like figured out, that color pop art is figured out, and then the person who's done it like an expansion of like um, like a I wrote in college or paper. So, like, everything is already kind of set, and now it's just like getting all the color I need to Because I find, like, both the pages seem so intimidating, like, starting to see out now. Like, like, it just makes me, like, dream. So, the fact that there's something there to build from, I feel like, like, it's happening. And then it's just showing up. So, like, trust me. Mm. Awesome. Um, yeah, I, th I think it also has led just, you know, as a comics reader to like an amazing, like democratization of, of cartooning. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you used to have to go to comics festivals and buy a bunch of mini comics, some of which would promise very awesome comics from really awesome covers. And you'd be like, okay, this is a real letdown. Mm -hmm. This is like a real $3 <laughs> bust. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and now it's like, oh, Instagram is like providing me like a constant feed of like really, really, really awesome work. Um, and Liz and Mike, I know that's how I found both of your works was through Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, Andrea, I found yours through the lovely Joseph Fox <laughs> bookshop. Um, and it's just like a, it's a very interesting and, and different space. And so like it also leads just like I, I have one other question about just community comics, especially indie comics, there's a big thing about like comics community and the like uh, the way that conventions work, both like independent comics conventions and then like some of the bigger ones obviously for the superhero y comics and stuff. Um, and COVID has definitely knocked that down considerably. But also like do you find a community when you do work for young people? Like, is that, 
they're not really going to conventions in the same way. They're not um, they're not showing up at like SPX or anything. How how do you find other cartoonists and connect with them in that world? Um, in terms of finding like a like trying to attract the readers and stuff like that. I'm literally going to a basketball com like facility next Saturday. <laughs> so I'm not bothering with conventions. I'm going to set up in the lobby of uh, the Monroe Sports Center because <laughs> it's going to be filled with hundreds of girls playing basketball. That's awesome. um, so that's, I feel like, and they're with their parents <laughs> who have $13, <laughs> I hope. Um, uh, I d uh, community in the comics industry is a bit weird for me personally right now. I don't know probably has to do with COVID. I think also has to do with, you know, like I, uh, I, this is very comic specific, but like I, I felt like, um, uh, that's, it's, it's actually sort of like, doesn't seem like uh, one thing anymore. Mm -hmm. It feels, uh, like it's a great many things, which is a good thing, mm -hmm. but it's also just very hard to sort of know all aspects of it the way I felt like it used to be as a reader and as a comics fan. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a challenge now. Um, like, and I think it's actually a good thing, but because ultimately I want, you know, I think we want to write and make comics. It doesn't matter about going to parties, <laughs> you know. Um, but I do like, again, to come back to like Instagram, it's been a good thing um, for that reason to sort of like connect. Because I've connected with a lot of people through it. Mm -hmm. It's not so good when Instagram goes down like for a day <laughs> and also not so good that you're relying on this, this platform, you know, that isn't great. Yeah. You know, I wish that Facebook didn't own them anymore. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, that's not great, the whole thing. It's free, but there's, there's compromises that you're making. Um, <laughs> it Community is so important when you're making art, and especially when you're making comics. And one of the nice things about indie comics is that no one makes too much, well, one of the nice things, like, because no one's making a lot of money. <laughs> That's nice. No, it's Everyone actually horrible. <laughs> Sorry. It's horrible, and it, it's awful um, that this labor is not valued. However, like, because no one's really making bank at it, like, it's, there's more freedom. Like, you can just make a, like, anyone can walk in and make a comic. Right. Um, and I've seen, like, a flourishing of uh, communities and enthusiasm around, you know, just like Tumblr comics, fan art comics, uh, the LGBTQ community at, at Indie Comic Cons is amazing and, and awesome. Uh, and it's not just like one monolithic community, right? It's, it's many, many different communities. Um, but uh, I don't know, it's hard because the work is so solitary and I find myself relying a lot on my friends from grad school, for instance, or from uh, like folks that I met through like local comics organizations because you need, like going back to your question about editing, like you need other eyes on your work. You can't just be you in a box for the rest of time. Like you absolutely need that for your work and also for your soul because you will, <laughs> you will go nuts without that kind of grounding presence of other creative people who understand it. I love it when artists get together and especially cartoonists get together who like understand the work that they make and what's weird about it because it's so idiosyncratic. It's hard to describe it with say like if you meet, uh, like if you're just talking to somebody who only writes children's books or if you're just talking to somebody who only, only illustrates children's books but doesn't read comics, like they're just very different languages, right? Mm -hmm. And so being able to like instantly talk about like how weird it is that this thing that we're doing <laughs> is, is very, very nice. All right, and my last question, and if anybody out there has some questions, Heidi's got some questions, um, is just like dream project. So it's a lot easier to pitch younger books for younger people, books for kids. But if like a publisher or whoever was gonna be like, all right, $1 million, you get to do your dream project. What would that dream project be for each of you? I need to think, do you? <laughs> Liz? <laughs> um, I think I'm kinda of doing my dream project. It's gonna be serious for Scholastic. That was like 10 out of 10 right there. Like a quiet, and it's my best. Like, the city would be cool. I like that So I get, I'm doing it. Right now. Awesome, that's really great. Um, mine's gonna. Uh, uh, 
I had this idea to adapt. I would make a very good book. No one would ever want to pay me for it. But did you ever see the 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 music video Cherry Pie by Warrant? <laughs> <laughs> the woman who's in that video, I read her autobiography, and it's a very compelling story. Oh, cool. And uh, her name is Bobby Brown, and I reached out to her, and she was okay with me adapting it, but people are not interested in, like, a hair metal <laughs> um, really book, but I really want to make that. <laughs> if I had $1 million, my that was extra, I would give it to you. You would fund the For Cherry the, Pie graphic novel? The Cherry Pie... <laughs> Lady graphic novel <laughs> autobiography adaptation. I mean, that's literally, I'm not going to be able to make it because no one wants <laughs> no it. Sounds cool. <laughs> but I want to do it. Anyone out there watching or in the audience right now who is interested in supporting this project for Mike, let's bring it to life for sure. Um, I would love to do. <laughs> Like, on the one hand, it's like gay kids solving mysteries. <laughs> and the other hand, I mean, why not be both? On the other hand, I would really love to do uh, comics uh, for kids about history. Um, like, because it's amazing and strange and weird and awful. <laughs> and History mysteries? I mean, yeah. <laughs> I feel like there's a theme song in there somewhere. Uh, and strange and weird. And so I think there's a way, I would love to do that and I might someday. That would be. I mean, it was a million dollars. Like, how are we talking? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, is a million dollars? It seems like an impossible amount of money, but also, like, if you were to do like a like a massive series, if you were like the next Lisa Hanawalt or something, like, it's not really that much money anymore. Like, if if you're if you break it down year by year, like, okay, like, like if it takes ten years, then how? yeah, like, <laughs> and then you have thirty percent for taxes, and then, you know, it's your like massive intellectual property that gets like picked up by like. Disney and then like distributed through Amazon or something. It's like, oh, well, actually, maybe this is the short end of the stick. Um, <laughs> but that sounds, I don't know, that sounds like it. That sounds like a million dollar project for, to me for sure. Um, uh, yeah, are you actually, yeah. So big moves, everybody's making big moves towards animation, everybody. Um, there's a lot of like thinking about like Brad Neely and Lucy Hannah Walt and people who are like went from indie comics to property to animation um and obviously there's like a huge space for that with kids stuff particularly is that something that is in your minds at all like taking taking stuff to the screen i guess i i'm not really um i mean i love it i think that i think this book would make a lovely cartoon <laughs> in case netflix is watching but <laughs> but i don't i don't think about it uh, too much I mean, I think that that's like, uh, uh, I think that selling off intellectual property of things is like a very valid valid form of like making some money in society and like talking about like economics. I mean, I'm definitely not anti selling off intellectual property of people because it's like something that I think is like an animation. Animation seems like just such a completely different thing that it's terrifying um but creatively intriguing um a lot of the book contracts like if it gets picked up by netflix or it gets picked up by you know a movie studio you're only making like a flat fee on it anyway i think like you make a few thousand dollars maybe if they sell those rights which is great that's wonderful but um developing your own series i think it would be there should be so much pressure to make sure that like the characters stay how they are and yeah stuff like that yeah i think it's the skip but it's just it's interesting to see like as studios are just sort of diving down deep you know it goes from like marvel movies to like end of the fucking world you know you, you start mm -hmm. to get like oh yeah basically if it's out there in print somebody is sort of sniffing around um trying to option things all right, so audience questions. Hello. Yes, I have um, things to say. I've been extremely stressed out, getting progressively more stressed out um, since you shared your age list, because I'm 25. <laughs> um, um, 
Oh, okay. I want to start with um, manga. I've been reading manga since I was like, I don't know, like 11. Mm -hmm. um, and I was, re and from that time, I was reading Gay Dojinchi, Dojinchi mm -hmm. which are um, fan made comics. Um, I, and uh, also, all the kids are at conventions. They're at like anime conventions mm -hmm. and then game, gaming conventions. Mm -hmm. um, and like a, a lot of my friends at table and sell stuff there. Do you guys, there's also a different practice, a totally different practice for like mangaka mm -hmm. or people who draw manga where they have like a whole team with them mm -hmm. um, working on an issue um, or they have other people's help. Um, and also there's a whole different like culture of market interests, but now I guess people are noticing that there's a lot of crossover, like there's a lot of crossover interest. And I just wonder if you guys um, read manga or watch anime and um, if, or does that uh, comics world seem totally different? Um. Do you guys want to? Okay. Uh, I, so I was born in 85, and I, I feel like I just, thank you for asking about manga. I feel like it doesn't get talked about enough. Um, yeah, I love manga. And these are, it's great. People love, like, there's a reason why I went, like, and I go for ever, whenever I went to Barnes & Noble in, like, 2011, 2013, there's just people just camped out in the <laughs> aisles, you know, spread eagle, just reading, you know. Like, that is love. <laughs> that is pure burning love, right? Um, and it, it sometimes gets like you know um, spat on because they're like ah, blah, blah. but it clearly like uh, it's real true burning passion based on real amazing art. So I, I ended up coming at it kind of backwards. Like I missed the initial wave. I, or I don't know. I'm not. I don't know enough about it to talk authoritatively about it. If either of you knows more about it, please jump in. <laughs> um, but uh, I know very little that there was like a surge in interest around like those 2010s, whatevers. And like, I missed that and then came at it backwards through like uh, a friend recommend, like piecemeal, like a friend recommended Ranma um, uh, or um, a friend recommended this like Japanese like food series or um, a friend recommended uh, uh, the Pushcart Man. Um, there's a lot. There, uh, like, there's a lot of like. Jap I think I came at it through like Japanese indie comics, not so much manga, but it's clearly related. Um, so that, like, I have tons of respect. And oh, <laughs> and uh, like uh, the whole sorry Gengaro Tagami <laughs> line of comics were massive too. Like, I have tons of. I know enough to know that I don't know anything about it. <laughs> and it has a whole industry and a whole following. Um, that is really interesting to see as a creator now, because like like Mike, like uh, do you, did you notice this like when comics started showing video game influences, like the kids who grew up playing video games, like then started making Adventure Time and then started making animation, oh, that's true. And, yeah. and you like start seeing it in the art, you're like, oh, this person grew up. Yeah. That's and the same thing with it's manga, right? You see that influence like spreading out and influencing that way. I'm not answering this question. Please. No, move that on. Is <laughs> I'm a huge. Man. <laughs> um, I, my Hero Academia, Death Note, um, loved the huge fan. Um, but like, going back to something that you said at the beginning, where you were like, so stressed and nervous about it, and I just like, totally know it when I tell you, like, I have had no idea what I've been doing for this period of time, and like, I was like, I'm going to go to grad school, or not, like, there is no one path, and there's no, like, one right path, so like, seriously, no one is going to tell me because it's just like, you know, you can end up doing what I'm doing, totally get it, that kind of thing, somebody else is going to tell you what you're doing. And, and everybody always says that, it sounds about like, oh, BS. I thought it was BS, it's amazing, but like, it's not. Because someone else's, someone's dream might be your nightmare. It's, it's all going to be okay. Thank you. That makes me feel better. Um, does anybody else have a question? Uh, I would also like to add that 25 is extremely young uh, for I, I feel like I went thing. to a creative arts uh, middle school and high school, so we had to choose majors and minors, and I chose communication, and most of my friends are in visual arts, so I was always like embarrassed to have my sketchbook with me, uh, because 
like my friends are insanely talented. They, they've, they've been so talented since like sixth grade. <laughs> um, so yeah, Liz, what you said is um, that really hits home for me. Um, I, I, you touched on this, Andrea. Um, I wanted to ask about this like generational divide with technology mm -hmm. um, and how different the experience of like being in the world is for kids who have grown up with the internet in their pocket um, and whether or not you um, all think about uh, like intertext or media, uh, intermedia um, and your work or if that is something you'd be interested in or if it's like mm -hmm. I don't you, yeah I think if I make I'm, I'm I'm working on a graphic novel now about humans, um, so it is something I'm keeping in mind, but I'm right now just trying to get the characters down. Um, but yeah, absolutely, like that's, there, you know, the life before the internet is like you don't, you only have so many ways to go before you run to a wall with information, and that's very different now for, for kids who are younger. So that has to reflect their reality or it's gonna be a period piece, right? Um, which it could be, God. Um, <laughs> Uh, sorry, I'm blanking. I, I, I really want to go just really quick back to the comment you said before about going to school and, uh, and also your comment about manga. And I, I don't, don't tell me if I'm putting words in your mouth, but like the, it occurs to me, it reminds me of a question I had um, when I was younger, which is like, what is legitimate art? Like, what is good art? What, what is good enough art? Or, or am I, when am I an artist? Or when am I finally, you know? who can tell stories, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, it's so hard when you're, <laughs> you know, you're doing your thing and then the person next to you is just freaking amazing mm -hmm. or more practiced. Um, and it's really weird being a professional artist because like your cred or whatever is, is tied to how much money you're making or whether or not like you can sit on a panel of chairs or like, it all seems a little bit nonsense, and yet it's also such a personal thing to make art and to share it, um, and a, uh, a craft, right? Um, that it, I think it gets very muddy very quickly, um, and it can get very painful very quickly. But um, from teaching, um, and from, uh, from even just like talking to, to, to young kids who are making art, and from talking to um, art students who are sophomores, uh, and from you know, just talking to other cartoonists, you know, at SPX or whatever, it's always really striking to me just how everyone has really cool stories in their lives that they care about, um, or really cool music video stories that they care about, or uh, like like hilarious, hilarious stick figure jokes that just kill. Like <laughs> everyone's got something really cool to say, and the the skill or the artistic whatever expression or how well you express it you know, with the words and pictures, it's just practice. That's just doing it over and over and over and over and over again. And you, you will get better as you do that. Um, but as far as legitimacy, like, yeah, everyone can be a freaking is an artist, right? And now I'm starting cursing. But like, yeah, like, that's my TED talk. <laughs> I have one, one comment on the, on the age thing. So I'm 46 years old. Um, the good thing about comics, like how it's nice that there's no money in it, it's also nice that there's very little institutional memory I found. <laughs> like, I honestly think of it this way. Like, the feeling of, like, still finding your voice and still making something that, you know, like, you know, is going to be the thing to, like, break you through, I've never felt that go away. Because I feel like, you know, no one remembers four years ago. Yeah. Um, but I think that's actually good because I've, I'm as excited now about making comics as I was 20 years ago. Um, you know, and, and I feel like the practice that I'm doing, you know, I feel like I'm getting better. Um, like, I don't feel like there's any sort of like, okay, I arrived and right. I mean, I'd like that to happen, but <laughs> <laughs> it won't. That's funny. All right, just quickly we'll go around and we'll start with Liz. If there's anything else just like that you are thinking about like as you, as you move forward with cartooning generally or that you think about when you think about like writing for kids? I know that's like a kind of an open-ended question, but like what, what thoughts do you want to sort of leave with or sit with? I guess I'm thinking about, I don't know, there's like a lot of problems in the world, a lot of stuff going on, and like how to make people want to like, you know, keep on fighting. Like that's, that's 
lot of big things, a lot of big scary things, a lot of information coming at us all at once. Just kind of process it, like breathe through it, get out of bed with a smile. That is an awesome thing to leave <laughs> with. Um, and I think it's like so important, especially when you're thinking about work with like young people, because thinking just about your anxiety <laughs> series, <laughs> like both both things are sort of happening. Like how are you how are you tackling these? It's really hard questions. These really big, intense things that kids think about all the time. Um, that's really great. Uh, how about you, Mike? So I mean, I've noticed the kids that I know are pretty messed up at the moment. Like, they've gone through some things, you know, the last two years has been hard for them in the way that it's been hard for them. Um, I want to do comics, you know, I want to write books that are, you know, deal with anxiety and deal with, uh, you know, a world that you can't feel like you're in control of. Um, and just to come back to your gaffe at the beginning, but it was a really good one, is that I like the, the idea that kids are people. And <laughs> these books, you know, they just have to be written with them in mind, but, it, you know, it can be, you know, they, it can speak to them about everything. Um, there's, there really is no sort of limit, like, you know, oh, well, it's middle grade, so you can't say that. Like, it's just not true. And, like, I think that's actually very exciting about middle grade. Um, I have a more of a technical question, if I can. If we have oh, totally, that. yeah. So... Mike and Liz, you are both working on graphic, you have created graphic novels and or are working on graphic novels. Um, how do you structure those? Because <laughs> that's an enormous question. But like, for instance, I was talking to Box Brown about how he created Andre the Giant. And he was going from making minis all the time to wanting to make his first graphic novel. And he said um, he started conceptualizing the book as like a series of minis brought together. Um, in that sense, but like to go from like shorter length or different kinds of length, like to novel size, there's like all kinds of different structural challenges with that. It's like kind of a terrible question to end on, but <laughs> to button on. But I really wanted to ask you that the entire night. So um, I feel like I tried to make anchor points of like beginning, middle, and end, mm -hmm. and like really flesh out like the head, and then yeah. I don't know if that's like the right way to do it, but that was like. Like to me, the graphic novel I just finished is like 160 pages, which is 160 times bigger than anything I've ever done in my life, and it's like the worst thing ever to do. Um, but if I had it broken down like that, I don't think it's cool. Um, I I think it was uh, there was a cartoonist. Chuck Forsman, yeah. End of the World. Yeah. Uh, he once wrote something, he said something like, every project feels like you're starting from scratch. Um, and I think that's true from just my experience with graphic novels, that you know, it's, each one is structured a little differently. Um, and uh, I know it sounds so, so not a great answer. <laughs> but <laughs> but true, the right? story, you know, it tells itself to you. <laughs> and, uh, like a mystery but I think it's true. It but I think there's truth right? in that, that um, that I've, each one I come to, it does sort of have its own, like, I sort of see the story in a certain way each time. Um, and there are some things where there's constraints about length, you know, but I do, it do, I do find it better to have an ending in mind. Mm -hmm. It always is better to have that. Um, but I'm sure you have that, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you have that. <laughs> totally. Uh. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I think that was an awesome, place to end. I think thinking about <laughs> beginning, middles, and ends <laughs> brings us to a fantastic wrap-up arc. Uh, I just want to thank all three of you again just for your amazing comics perspective and for like the really cool work you're putting out uh, in the world. So uh, follow them all on Instagram. <laughs> uh, buy their books. Pre-order all of Liz's books. Um, get excited. Uh, and thank you all for coming. Yeah, so. seriously, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. And, and thank you again. Thank you, Liz. You can stay on for a second and we'll, we'll gather around. <laughs> Say hello. <laughs>
you need a hand? 